neat, neat stuff. So how many people have black walnut plantations or young hardwood plantations? Raise them up high. Okay. How about conifer plantations, eastern white pine, red pine? How many people have those? All right. So I'm going to be a little biased today. I'm going to focus mostly on hardwood species. And for the conifer maintenance, for the, the pruning of conifers, red pine specifically and eastern white pine, I'm going to refer you to probably your Wisconsin DNR course. Because I don't have a lot of expertise in pine plantation maintenance. The reason why? From Illinois, we're 99% hardwoods. So we do not really have a conifer market for, for our eastern white pine or red pine. All right? So today we're going to talk about pruning timber trees for form and for function. And we'll talk about exactly what that means. And I may pose a few questions to the audience. It's kind of just a show of hands type of deal. But what I'll try to do is I'll try to get through these slides as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, I have about a 10-hour presentation, and I think we only have about 50 minutes. So someone needs to yell at me when we have 15 minutes left, okay? Because I want to leave ample time to address as many questions as possible, all right? Okay, so today we're going to talk about the mechanics behind pruning. We're going to talk about some basic terminology, what it means, like branch, bark, collar, branch bark, bridge, so on and so forth. We're going to talk about pruning for form. And pruning for form is essentially pruning, it's corrective pruning. You know, trees that have multiple leaders. How do we go about correcting those type of issues? Something that's been mauled by a white-tailed deer. How do we go about correcting that issue? So that's what we refer to as pruning for form or <coughs> corrective pruning. Pruning for function is what we call lateral pruning. That's where we're pruning for the high value trees. Getting those prime <coughs> saw logs, getting those veneer logs. So when I talk about pruning for function, function is more like value, all right? So they're different, they're markedly different. We'll talk briefly about when you should start pruning your trees. When, as far as the age cycle, when you planted those trees, and what time of year. And we're going to talk about, you know, dormant season preference for pruning your trees. And then, of course, which trees you should prune. All right? I think with Emerald Ash Borg being here, I mean, if you're investing time, resources, and labor into pruning white ash, green ash, black ash, blue ash, you're not going to get a return on investment. And we'll talk a little bit about return on investment. So the goals of this presentation is basically we're pruning for form, we're pruning for function, why you should prune, how do you prune, when you should prune. So basic concepts that we need to understand prior to going into or diving off the deep end into pruning. We're going to talk about target pruning. Target pruning is just a fancy name that Dr. Alex Shigo came up with. And it's a pruning technique that focuses on the branch, bark, ridge, the bark collar, or the branch collar, and something called this callus tissue, or wound wood. And those are very important terms, this callus tissue, this wound wood. So we'll talk about trees and healing. Trees don't heal, all right? They wound over. It's important to understand that. Callus tissue is basically scar tissue made up of large, thin-walled cells that form around these wounds, that form around these injuries. And when we prune a tree, we are making a wound. We are making an injury. So we need to understand what this callus tissue, this callus tissue does and what it looks like. We'll show you pictures of what a properly wounding stub or injury or pruning um, cut will look like. And here we go. So this is a properly formed Wound wood or callus tissue. It's got this donut shape. And that's what we're looking for, you know, two to three years after we make a proper pruning cut. If it doesn't look like this, you're doing it incorrectly. You're doing it wrong. One of our vocab words for the day is this branch bark ridge. It's this little area right here. 
So basically, you got this uh, cross that marks where the branch, right here, this branch has been removed, and the main trunk, it's where they meet. And this little area helps us target, identify where we began our pruning cut. And this is a branch collar. This wrinkled area, this wrinkled tissue, these wrinkled cells, all right? We don't want to ever prune into this area because if we do, we will not get proper callus tissue development. That wound, will, that wound wood will not develop properly, okay? And this is just a, a, a schematic, a typical schematic showing, you know, the branch collar right here, the bark ridge, different examples, how we go about making pruning cuts on a dead branch, how we go about making pruning cuts on a live branch. Slightly different techniques, but the methods are almost identical. Okay, so going back to that point I made, trees do not heal. They wound over, all right? So trees form a barrier zone around the wood. And this barrier zone separates that injury, in our case, a pruning cut, from healthy wood or cells, okay? And it's basically this chemical boundary that forms after the wounding process begins, which is a good thing, all right? And we want to optimize that wounding. We don't want to interfere with it. At one point, don't ever put paint on your pruning cuts. Everyone raise your hand and promise me you will never put paint on your pruning cuts. There may be a time, you know, uh, say one of your oak trees gets injured during the middle of summer and you may have to cut or prune a branch then you may have to apply some type of pruning paint. Never use an oil-based paint or dressing. Always use a latex paste, all right? But, you know, typically never, never apply any type of wound dressing to a freshly cut prune, or a freshly cut injury or pruning cut. Basic pruning tools, use the proper tool. Otherwise, you will not get the proper results. Basically, your callus tissue will be almost uh, minimized or destroyed. Uh, basically, you'll hasten the time of closure. So if you make pruning cuts with your chainsaw, don't expect that perfect little donut of a callus shape to come back. All right, you're gonna do a lot of damage. So promise me, do not do pruning cuts with chainsaws. You will be disappointed, guaranteed. And if you use the proper tools, it will translate into greater financial returns in the future, assuming you do the, the, the pruning cuts properly, right? Hand pruners, typically what we use for tree form to correct something because, uh, I'm sorry here for the error, but basically hand pruners, we have, uh, we have bypass on the right, and then we have the anvil type on the left. Those are good for correcting, uh, you know, small trees. Basically, branches or stems up to maybe one inch in diameter. All right, these are relatively cheap. You can find them at any store, hardware store. You can find them at Lowe's, Home Depot, Farm and Fleet, you name it. All right, they range in value from $5, probably up to $35 or $40. You know, a high-end pair of Felcos might push you up over $35. So I use a lot of hand pruners when I'm, uh, you know, modifying or reshaping young black walnut trees. I'll use a lot of hand pruners. Bypass loppers, they're good for branches up to, you know, probably less than two and a half inches in diameter. And most of the bypass, most of the loppers you see in the store, they do have some anvil style bypass loppers, but go for the bypass loppers, all right? Bypass versus I'm sorry, misspoke. Anvil versus bypass. Bypass is typically going to give you a better cut than an anvil style pruner or an anvil style lopper. So if you can, and if you have the choice and you have an extra few dollars, go the bypass route. 
You will get cleaner cuts. You really will. Because the anvil tends to crush the cells, where the bypass pruners make a nice, nice cut. Then pruning saws. I use pruning saws almost all the time. I can cut a one inch limb with a pruning saw. I can cut up to a four, six inch limb with a pruning saw. I love pruning saws. I like the fixed blade. I also like the boldy blades. And they come in many different brands. Corona, Felco, Silky, a lot of different brands of pruning saws. Come in different price regimes, okay? You typically get them for 15 bucks where you can spend up to $40 for a pruning saw. Pole pruners, when we start talking about uh, Pruning in stands that are much taller, trees that are you know, 15, 18, 20 feet, 40 feet tall, we have these uh, pole pruners. They can be fixed length, meaning that they reach up to maybe 9 feet tall. Or you can get extensions, which means that you can get up to maybe 17, 19 feet. So they come in handy. I personally do not like the pole pruners. I like the pole saws, personally. It's just a personal preference. Pole saws have a saw on the end, pole pruners have more of a hook and with a rope attached that makes it cut like a bypass cut. And, uh, oops, let's go back. So pole saws are a little more expensive. I own uh, a, couple, a couple of silky saws. They run about $119. But when I'm doing any type of uh, lateral pruning or side pruning in walnut plantations, I'm grabbing my telescoping pole pruner. I love it. I can get up to probably 25 feet. Even though I usually don't go up to 25 feet, I usually only go up to 19 feet. And remember that number, because we're going to talk about that number uh, later in the presentation. Not 19 feet, 17 feet. Gas-powered pole saws, uh, they're, they're good for uh, storm damage, ice damage, but they're not really good for lateral pruning to produce high-value timber. The cut is just, it's not a pruning cut. You know, it can help facilitate removal of some large branches, and then go back and use a more appropriate tool to get that fine pruning cut on your trees, okay? And of course, how many people have a gas-powered pruning saw? Yeah, they're not cheap, and they're kind of heavy. Maybe I'm just a wimp, but I like my telescoping, you know, pruning saw much better. Here's an example. Here's uh, you know basically about a 22-year-old black walnut planting, maybe about 25 years. Um, and basically in this example here, here's Steve Feltz. Steve Feltz, a DNR forester of the state of Illinois. He's a walnut council member, a huge advocate of black walnut. This particular walnut stand is in southern Illinois. Uh, these soils weren't optimum or ideal for black walnut development. We're really not going to go into site indices and site quality for black walnut. But here, we're just basically showing a telescoping pole pruner, and he's going up to a minimum of 17 feet. I'm going to say that number probably five more times today. We're going to get to the reason why. And here's just a little close-up view of that, uh, of that pruning saw head. We're getting up to that 17-foot number, that premier number that we're after, especially for our woods. Okay, especially for hardwoods. Another uh, clear stem pruning. We're pruning the, the lateral branches, the side branches for quality. We're pruning it for those prime saw logs, for that veneer log potential. This just happens to be about an 18 year old northern red oak stand in central Illinois. So I have some of my Illini Forester students out there doing some lateral pruning. And we're going up to an ideal height of 17. If you want to write anything down as far as major brands uh, for pruning saws, I mean, there are others, but I mean, these are the big ones. You know, Felco, Fiskers, I love Fisker brand um, pruning saws, I really do. They're very affordable and they work very, very well. Corona, great, Silky, Fenco, Fano, just, you know, some stellar pruning brands right there. I think you get what you pay for when you buy a pruning saw. And these are very established names in the business. Obviously, there's a right way and there's a wrong way to pruning. All right, 
can identify the wrong way and encourage you to do it the right way. Something called stub cutting. So we have the ridge, we have the collar, and we're leaving this little stub. That's the wrong way to prune. We don't want to leave that stub. We can get closer. We can get closer to the ridge, and we can not go into the collar. We can come down here. This cut should have been more like this. This is called a flush cut. A flush cut is worse than a stub cut. Basically, what happened? Where's our ridge? What happened to our ridge? What happened to our collar? They're gone. So what type of callous tissue are we going to develop after a cut like this? Is it going to be that perfect donut shape after two years? No, it is not. We just created a very large wound. We're going to get improper wound wood development, and this is a bad cut. All right? This is a perfect cut. This is what we're looking for. We've got, the little, we've got a ridge. We're protecting our collar. This is a perfect cut using an appropriate pruning saw without using the chainsaw. Larger branches, sometimes we have to use a modified technique. We'll cut a larger branch using three steps because we have the extra weight that can possibly strip bark when that branch starts to come off the tree in our final pruning cut. So what we'll do, I mean, here's our, this is the area that we're going to cut. We have our ridge, we have our collar that we're protecting, we're going to be cutting right here. However, because this is a larger limb, larger limb, you know, over four <coughs> inches, over six inches, anything that we can get some tearing potential. We don't want that bark to strip down past that branch collar. If it strips past this collar, we're not going to get that optimum wound wood development, right? So here, in this instance, we make an undercut. We sever this compression wood. Then we make a second cut on top of the tree, which is the tension wood. And once we do that, that, most of that limb is severed. Then we come back and remove that stub. We didn't leave the stub. We intentionally made a stub to facilitate the final, the final pruning cut. And in reality, other than a figure, this is kind of what we're looking at again, our bark ridge, our collar, optimum cut. One thing I should note that on pruning saws, pruning saws, the way their teeth are oriented, they are a cut on a pull stroke only. They cut on a pull stroke only. Remember that for pruning saws, okay? We talk about this, this donut, this optimum, optimum, optimal uh, callus tissue development. This is what we're talking about. This was recently pruned. We're starting to get that donut shape after one year. And then, you know, the inside of that donut hole is pretty much closing. A perfect pruning cut. So after five years, you're just going to have a little bit of bark distortion. With that, uh, we're going to go into it. We'll talk about why it's important to prune young trees. Because this still creates a defect. That defect is now in the interior part of the tree. So year after year later, it's putting on clean, not free wood. And that's what we're looking for. We want that not free wood. So pruning from, or, uh, Pruning for form, otherwise known as corrective pruning. We're correcting an issue, typically with the form of a tree. And uh, I think we kind of covered this. How many of you are actively engaging in pruning right now? Okay. How many of you feel very comfortable, confident <laughs> in choosing which trees to prune? So corrective pruning used to correct uh, form deficiencies, all right? A tree that's growing in an S sometimes can be difficult to correct. 
Sometimes we have to start over on those type of trees. Sometimes corrective pruning cannot correct things, and therefore we use a technique called coppicing. We start over, we cut it off at the base. We can also correct multiple leaders. Often in our walnut stands, we will have multiple leaders. All right, we want a central dominant leader. That gives us that nice, that nice straight form stem, that nice straight form bowl, which is what we want. Uh, poor branch angles, you know, the crotch angles are, are too tight, and therefore they can be more susceptible to splitting. Uh, we, we want to uh, try to avoid that. Broken tops are very common here in the Midwest, especially after ice events, storm events, so on and so forth. Um, and we have to go out there and correct those issues because sometimes we had a central dominant leader and after a storm event occurs, now we do not. Uh, low forks, how do we modify low fork trees? A lot of us have low fork trees, especially if you have deer. If you have deer, you frequently have many low fork trees out in your timber. And corrective pruning, this is really important. It's almost explicitly practice in our younger stands. Our trees that you can get to, if you're five feet tall, six feet tall, okay, you have to be able to reach the top of that tree. If you can't get to it, then you're gonna have to get a step ladder. And that's, that sucks, <laughs> it really does, all right? So try to get to your trees at a very young age so you can modify, so you can correct their form. Um, these young trees, special young trees, I mean, if defective, they can't be modified. But sometimes they are beyond corrective measures, and then you start over. You start over by composite. Here's just an example from a, a wonderful publication, and I have this at the end of the presentation. This is one of my favorite uh, publications from Purdue University. It's about corrective pruning for black walnut. So if you are if you are growing black walnut and your black walnut stand is you know, three to fifteen years of age. You need to go to this website and take a look at these pictures because they're really outstanding. So here's just a, you know a typical example of you know choosing which dominant leader that you are going to maintain on this individual tree, and you have competing uh, upper lateral branches that may be that may be competing with that dominant leader. So how do you correct those issues? Well, here's just an example on which branches he pruned which ones he kept, and with the ultimate form right here. And I'm going to be honest, I mean, there's nothing in this presentation that's brand new, all right? I have no novel science to pass on to you. You know, what Dr. Alex Shigo has been doing for, well, what he did for 40 some years, I mean, we're still doing it today, all right? Just another example of uh, a corrective pruning. We have this, uh, we lost our main leader, and now this uh, lateral branch has kind of expressed interest in becoming the new dominant. So how do we encourage that behavior? And basically, we have a training lateral branch, what is basically forcing this once lateral branch to become the new vertical dominant leader in this particular instance. So this publication goes through different iterations on how to correct different uh, malformities in, a different, in, a, in most trees, specifically walnut. So what happens when you have multiple leaders in a very young tree, or young black walnut? Well, sometimes, basically, you can dictate which leader you want, preferably one that has a little uh, greater girth or circumference to it. And then using masking tape, you can, uh, you can mask, you can tape the two dominant leaders together, and then you stub cut the one you don't want. You stub cut it above where you tape them off. So here's the masking tape, right here. Tape them together. He is going to cut this off right here. And basically that encourages, because both of these were lateral branches. So he wants this one to become the new dominant. So he's taped them together and he stub cut the other one. Basically it will train that one on the left to become the new dominant. Here's an instance where basically we had about a three inch tree that's completely lost its top. 
Instead of starting all the way over, in this publication they talk about trees that are under three to four inches in diameter, especially for black walnut, that sometimes you can cut the tree off at about four to five feet. And what will happen, as long as the tree is less than three to four inches in diameter, you can do this, okay? So basically, he cuts them off at four feet tall, about four feet of height, and basically we get a, a bud that develops and you get a new branch. So that is a technique where you don't have to start completely over. You don't have to cut this tree off at the ground, coppice it. Sometimes you can get away by using this technique. Again, part of corrective pruning. Rules of thumb, general rules of thumb, never remove more than 50% of a live tree. You want to keep a tree at least probably 50% canopy, foliage, think about foliage, all right? If your tree's 10 feet tall, you want about five feet of foliage on that tree. So about 50% foliage at any given time during the development of the tree. That's optimal. Sometimes it's not gonna happen. <laughs> and uh, never remove more than one third of the live crown during a year. So basically if you have a 20 foot tall tree, don't feel obligated that, hey, maybe I should remove that lower 10 feet of crown. Or maybe you should only remove one third of that crown this year and then remove the other part the following year, okay? Just general rules of thumb, we cheat every once in a while. When in doubt, have a forester come out. Or attend these workshops, these seminars. I encourage you to go to these Walnut Council um, seminars that they have, tree farm meetings that they have, because you really learn a lot. You get the hands on. We can only cover so much in the PowerPoint presentations. I can't really show you. But if you attend these workshops, these field days, that's where you become really adept at becoming, you know, a, a, a tree pruning expert. You really do. You can prune live branches. Um, I encourage you to prune them uh, during the latter part of the dormant season. Optimum is probably January through February. But if you can get out there in December, so be it. Go out there in December. And this year, heck, you can still be out there in early March, okay? <laughs> dead branches, feel free to remove dead branches or prune them any time of year. You can prune dead branches any time of year. Live branches, the reason why we recommend dormant season pruning is because of insects and disease. Now we're gonna talk about pruning for, fun for function what we also refer to as clear stem pruning and lateral stem pruning, okay? And here's the goal. Basically, we're trying to produce trees that have not free wood. That's the goal with lateral branch pruning. Otherwise, there's no other reason to do it. All right? We're going for those prime quality saw logs those veneer quality logs. That's what we're going after, that not free wood. Most publications will tell you that uh, you want to begin this lateral branch pruning when trees are about 8 to 12 feet tall. You can do it a little before or a little after. That's fine. Again, just general rules of thumb. If you're going to implement this type of strategy, if you are going to invest your time, your money, your effort into doing it. I want you to prune to at least nine feet. Prune to at least nine feet. Don't prune to six feet. Don't prune to eight feet. If it takes you several years to get up to nine feet, that's the ultimate goal. But just don't stop at four feet. Don't stop at six feet. Right? And another thing. If the tree is up to 34 feet tall, over 34 feet tall, over 40 feet tall, if you can prune that tree up to 17 feet, if you have the resources to, to do that, I encourage you to do it. And here's why. It's basically, saw logs are based on, uh, let's see, what are, what are doing here? <laughs> Sorry, guys. I think I'm going to get ahead of myself. That's okay. All right, so we prune up to 8.6. Eight, 8.6 eight, is a minimum saw log dimension, all right? 
eight feet plus six inches of trim. So we want to prune it to nine feet. Nine feet will give us an optimum saw log dimension. All right? We prune up to 17 feet if we can, because 17 feet is a definition of a butt log. All right? Over 70% of the value in a tree is in the first butt log. That's why that 17 foot number is so important. Eight feet six plus eight feet six is 17 feet. So we're trying to go for the most value. And that's where it's at. All right. Certain hardwoods are good self pruners. Hey, what about that? What about the 17 feet? What if it's like four foot? Uh, if you want to go to 21 feet, Knock, your, knock yourself out. That's, it's, those are called upper logs. Those are upper logs. Uh, typically, they don't have the quality of a butt log. But that's not always true because you can get veneer logs from uppers, what we call upper logs. You can get veneer logs from upper logs. But I will tell you that over 70% of the value would be the first 16, this is the first 17 feet. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they, they optimize them, yeah. It's just general rule of thumb. General rule of thumb, try to get to 17 feet. I'll get back, uh, red oak. Northern red oak, typically very good self pruner. A lot of times it doesn't need a lot of help. It doesn't need a lot of uh, lateral branch pruning. However, black walnut and anything in the white oak family, they need a lot of help. <coughs> All right, anyone who's growing black walnut knows that, man, I just wish these trees would kind of self-prune themselves and grow a little straighter and always have that central dominant leader. That'd be really nice. What you find, especially in pure black walnut stands, you have to do a lot more pruning. However, if you had interplanted your black walnut with, say, eastern white pine or northern red oak or other species, down in central Illinois, sometimes we can use yellow poplar to be a trainer tree. And those trainer trees really help self-prune those other species, especially black walnut. Because black walnut just it's, it's tough to grow straight. It really is. It needs a lot of help. Some of the conifers, uh, eastern white pine uh, does do a good job of self-pruning. Problem is, is that uh, those, those dead stubs will remain intact unless you, unless you remove them. The red pine doesn't do a good job at all at self-pruning, so it needs a lot of help. Um, I just threw this out there for any of you who are interested in nut production. Rather than saw log production, if you are interested in nut production, I encourage you to prune up to a height of nine feet. That's kind of a standard. Pruning up to nine feet for you know pecans or uh, black walnut, English walnut, so on and so forth. So if that's your interest, try to prune up to nine feet tall. Prune your best form trees. There's no sense investing time and money into pruning these doggy trees, trees that have no future to produce a high quality saw log. Again, think return on investment. It's time, it's money, it's expensive. But pruning is a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Prune your highest value species. We already talked about pruning ash. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't prune ash. No way. No, no, uh, no return on investment. Not for me. Prune, uh, it's optimum to prune branches while they are still small. Basically, we want to prune branches that have nothing but sap wood development. All right? Once a branch attains a size over three to four inches in diameter, it will start to develop heartwood, and heartwood can decay. So once you make a wound in a branch that contains heartwood, you can get decay. But if you prune branches that are smaller than three inches, it contains nothing but sapwood. Sapwood does not decay. Rule of thumb, try to get those branches before they attain a diameter over three inches. Especially black walnut. All right, some general uh, pruning do's and don'ts. Uh, think about return on investment. If you can, if your state offers cost share incentives, jump on it. All right, this will really help you derive a greater return on investment, especially if you can have a state agency or a federal government chip in. Otherwise, sometimes it can be difficult to get that return on investment. Attend hands-on workshops. I mean, there's, there's no substitute for hands-on hands -on instruction. There really is. Prune your best, most vigorous trees. Avoid pruning during the growing season. 
you know, just think about what will. You know, just uh, what do we, our keynote presentation, okay? Thousand <laughs> cake disease. All right, you see those bugs in the winter? No, you don't. Prune them during the normal season. And we've already covered the other three points. Right here, here, and here. We can go forward. I like to start from the top down when I do pruning. Especially corrective pruning. I like to start from the top down. All right. I like to identify a main leader and remove any competing branches and proceed with the removal of the lower limbs. This is for corrective pruning. This happens to be a Walnut Council workshop. So this is on, on landowner's property, basically teaching everyone, hands on, how to prune these trees. And some of these trees, I mean, they look relatively ugly at first. Then when you kind of get through, wade through this uh, tangle of mess, then you really get to see that, wow, this tree actually does have a well-formed main stem. That's basically what they're at. So just some things, you know, assess the individual trees. Every tree is going to have a different plan. So assess every tree, develop a plan on how you're going to go about it. He's starting from the top, and he's moving his way down. And then you go to town. You start pruning. Just some more slides here. Pruning cut, finding that ridge, finding that collar. You get that perfect <coughs> pruning cut. It's going to develop that nice callus tissue, perfect bone wood. The goal, ultimate goal of any pruning for me is wood quality. All right? And this workshop, this presentation was about form and function. <coughs> I'm really interested about function, and it's about return on investment for me. It really is. I only want to shape and cultivate those trees that have that potential to produce that high quality prime saw log or veneer log. Jeez. This is kind of this is an example of a properly cut tree and how it's wounding, how it's wounded. I'll cover the wound over time. This was an improperly pruned tree. And basically what happened is that the branch was too large. It actually had hard wood in it when it was cut. Therefore, decay is now entered inside deeper. And so basically, the branch should have been pruned in the first place. All right. So this, this slide is what I consider important because many people don't understand where the quality zone is in a log. So this is why it's so important that we prune at a young age. We want any type of remnants of pruning damage to be in here, the heart center. The heart center is the lowest quality zone in a saw log, in a veneer log. We want all the defects to be in there. We don't want the defects to be out here. We want all clear wood, all clean wood, to be on the outside of that center zone. That's why it's so important to get to those trees when they're age you know, 10, age 20. We want that lower quality material, that knotty wood, to be in here, not out there. Lateral pruning for veneer logs, select the best form trees, don't spend your time on the dogs. Again, return on investment. Just some more lateral pruning here. Walnut plantation, ready for some lateral pruning, choosing the best trees. So this particular, so Steve Felt, I being our forester, went out with a landowner, basically flagged the trees to prune. All right, no sense pruning the trees that aren't going to produce a high quality saw log. Because that's basically what this land went along. They wanted saw logs, and they wanted veneer logs. So what do you want? Do you want this guy? Or do you want this nice veneer log right there? I know what I want. We've got one you should prune, staunch advocate of dormant season pruning. I know there are people out there who say prune all year round. Right, there's some people in the walnut council that advocate anytime you can go prune your walnut trees, go do it. I do not advocate that. I do not at all. So dormant season only. 
That's what I've read, that's what I always thought, and I haven't read anything else that would uh, go against that, that science. I never prune during the growing season. There are exceptions, a major caveat, whether related injuries cause that tree. How are we doing on time? Who's, who's watching me? How much time are we? 18 minutes? All right. And this is the reason why we need dormant season pruning again. Less sap or resin flow to contend with. No airborne pathogens, no insects. It's a no brainer in my book. <coughs> that branch can prune, be pruned any time of year. We already talked about that. How high do we go? We've killed this. Eight feet, six inches, or 17 feet, whichever you can get. If you can only go 10 feet, get 10 feet. If you can only get to 12 feet, get to 12 feet. I typically won't go beyond 17 feet. Again, this is the reason why. You know, that 70, you know, that 60 to 80 percent of the value is in that buck law. And this is what we're talking about. You know, get to that, you know, eight feet, six inches, nine feet. And then if you can get to that second phase, getting that 17 feet, try to get there. Whether it's on a conifer or whether it's on a hardwood. <clears throat> Pruning conifers, almost identical to proving hardwoods, and it really is. I mean, you still have the collar, I'm sorry, you still have the collar, you still have the ridge. Um, now, I, I want to talk briefly about this slide. It's this cost benefits, that return on investment. Is it a sound investment to prune your conifers? And in certain areas of the Midwest, especially the Lake States, it is. All right, these red pine plantations, these eastern white pine plantations, they are valuable, they are worth something. In the state of Illinois, I would never advocate pruning eastern white pine or red pine. You're just, you're not gonna get your money back. You will not. I can be proved wrong, and there's gonna be certain examples where I can but I would never do it personally. So if you do have conifers and you are thinking about pruning and you are in the Lake State area that procures a lot of eastern white pine saw logs, red pine saw logs, then I highly encourage you to speak with your DNR forester because they're gonna have that local knowledge. They're gonna say yes or no, you will get that return on investment or you will not. And standard pruning height for conifers. You know, you try to get that first nine feet, you go up to 17 feet. And here's a red pine. Clear stem pruning. This was in uh, central Illinois at Mississippi Forest, which is now Lot Miller State Forest. Just an example back in the day that I actually tried to show that, you know, clear stem pruning on red pine would, uh, would earn a higher dividend, but it didn't. All right, so I'm going to stop there and then entertain any questions that the audience has. First. How do you know when you're using a cold trimmer, trimming 17 feet up or 9 feet up, that you're getting the right type of cut outside of the collar and stuff like you're supposed to have? So basically, you start at lower heights. I mean, you become comfortable with knowing that you're not going to flush cut. The most important part when you're pruning up higher is not flush cutting. So if you have to leave a stub, leaving a slight stub is better than doing a flush cut. Over time, I mean, you can use an octopus. That takes a lot of time, right? Um, or you can get a lift, that takes a lot of time and money too. But it's just becoming confident in your technique and your approach, making sure that you don't get those flush cuts at those higher heights. And that's an excellent question, and it just takes experience. It takes time out of the woods. Yes, sir? Is there any pruning that you can do that will increase the rate in which your tree will grow? Uh, I'm not aware of anything like that. Usually it's uh, you know maintaining a certain density of trees, doing crop tree release, and uh, making sure that you're planting the right trees on the right site so that you are getting optimum development. But as far as rate of growth, I mean, pruning is not about rate of growth. It's about clear wood. Yes, sir? Yeah, 
Yeah, so um, <clears throat> my question is about standing timber. Uh, how well can the expert timber buyer tell from the quality of the log before cutting it what's going to be inside that log? Well, a trained eye, they can basically see external defects. They can see distortions in the bark, irregularities in the bark texture. I mean, they, their eyes, I mean, that's what they're paid to do. They're paid to pick up on those little superficial things, pin knots, cat faces, you name it, just a little, the most modest, most benign distortion. I mean, they try to dig it for it. And that's why marketing, you know, using the lump sum marketing approach where you try to optimize and buffer anything like that. For one person saying that one tree has a defect, and therefore it's worth less. So I think other people did. I think a, a lot of the tree buying anymore, there's a lot of partnerships going on between the, the tree buyer and the tree owner. And they are guaranteed a price, but after the log actually has gone to a veneer shop, yeah. Then they determine the final price and they share the, you know, the wealth if it's there. So you might not be able to tell when they cut the tree immediately what right. it's worth. But if you're having to be selling it in partnership with the company, you're, you're still an end result still going to be there. Yeah, so selling on shares, there's pros and cons of selling on shares. I, I'm not a huge advocate. I'm really not. But there, there are certain cases and instances where selling on shares will net a landowner more money. But that's more of a timber marketing. Uh, presentation that we could go into that. But certain species, I mean, you're right. I, I never uh, estimate the near potential of sugar maple. I, because basically you have to look at the heartwood. You know, if it's less than a quarter heart or less than a, you know, less than a quarter heart, then it has the potential to be used as a veneer quality tree. And sugar maple, I, I would never prune sugar maple in central Illinois because that's really not the optimum market that we're trying to grow. We're trying to go, you know, high quality white oak and red oak and black walnut, but yes, you're right. Certain species, you really cannot identify any potential internal defect until the tree is on the ground, and sometimes until it's cut or sliced. So, but I think the rest of that question is beyond the scope of this presentation. Yes, sir. Uh, what size uh, white oak uh, that's been browsed can you start corrective pruning? I, I mean, you can you can rectify, you know. A 20 foot tall tree that has been totally demolished, damaged, rubbed to death. Uh, a tree that size, I would coppice. I mean, so it's 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 the balance where. About a three foot that looks like a bush. I, I, I coppice that tree. If it's so ugly, if it is uncorrectable, you can start over. Because if you cut it off the ground level, which is called coppicing, within one year, basically that re sprout. That stump sprout will almost be equal to the height of that tree within one year. All right, coppice during the dormancy. Coppice during the dormancy. When you coppice the tree, you show the diagram of the four or five feet up. Yeah, that was a little that's different technique. You cut it right off the ground, <coughs> because then it makes that little bowl that's going to be down the bottom, and everything above that's going to be a quality tree. At four or five feet, you're going to have a visible bowls there. But it's only three to inch. It was only three to four inches in diameter at that point. So any bulge, any defect that was at four and a half feet is all going to be centered in the center wood of that of that log. So that defect zone will be interior, and then you'll have clear, not free wood on the outside. So that's just a technique that Purdue came up with. So sometimes you don't have to start all over by coppicing. Sometimes you can. I don't know, for lack of a better word, almost high coppicing. But almost all coppicing occurs at ground level. But can a logger see that defect? When not, not 60 years later. Not 60 years later. Yeah, not 60 years later. That'd be a very impressive logger, very impressive timber buyer. Uh, let's get some back row. Owls. Owls. Does it, have a, does it have pruning teeth? You know, the pruning saws have a lot more teeth. And the only thing I can worry to me about is if it's a reciprocating action and pruning saws are made to work on full stroke, I guess I'd have to look at it. And uh, I, I'm not intimately familiar with that type of saw. I apologize. Sort of that. Once you have a, a tree that seems to perpetually put out 20 liters, is it worthwhile to keep pruning it up? 
Yeah, sometimes you can have bad genetics. So everyone hear that question? You know, the tree consistently puts out a double leader. And doggone it, I just, it, it won't obey. It's a bad dog. It's a bad dog. Get rid of that bad dog. Yes? Everyone hear that? So what do you do when a, when a deer nips the bud off your terminal leader? And the gentleman said basically shoot the deer. And I concur. I think that's a nice enough question. And I think that's a silver culturally sound treatment in shooting the deer. But we talk about corrective pruning. So basically it's seeing if you can get a lateral branch to, to basically take over for that dominant leader that was browsed off. And that happens all I mean, we contend with it, but we have to correct it. Well, not necessarily, because what it might do is it might put up a lateral from that terminal. Now you have a lateral come up, so now you try to train that lateral to become the new, new central dominant leader. In the back, sir, right there. Uh, how do you just, do you have to disinfect your tools or anything for disease? Or uh, I don't, if, if you have an old wheel pocket, you need to do some pruning or something like that, or during the, you know, growing season. During the growing season, if you have some verticillium wilt issues, if you have some oak wilt issues, and it's more of a corrective thing in your yard, then by all means, use 70% alcohol. Uh, don't use a, a full bleach. If you have to use bleach, you gotta dilute it, you know, significantly. I mean, uh, but out in the woods, for pruning, I do not. No way. Because then if you have to prune after every cut. Excuse me? If it's an ornamental tree in your yard. Okay. All right, you can use rubbing alcohol. Five okay. minutes? The, let's see here. In the very back. I'll get you. Yeah, we have a lot of problems with deer rubbing the bark off our trees. Okay. We have a lot of problems with deer rubbing the bark off our trees. Sure. Some, uh, Are you shooting them as well? Uh, we have a lot of farmers. Okay. Uh, the idea in our I would do that on your poor form trees. I would do that on your dogs. Because in a stand, most, most black walnut plantings, for instance, most hardwood plantings, have been planted at 436 trees per acre. That's how we do it in Illinois. So 10 by 10 spacing. So not every tree, you can't grow every tree to maturity when you plant 436 trees. So sometimes you got to let the deer have something to play with. And if you leave your lower branches on everything, then you're really not going to get that, that potential benefit by having that clear, not free wood. So it's a give and take relationship. Where, yeah. <laughs> Is that your can empty, sir, or full? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But that works. Yeah, I, I like it. I like it. Yeah, pruning walnuts. Every once in a while, you'll have a tree that, after you put it two or three years later, it'll start shooting branches out. Yeah, you give a 
little water sprouts. Yeah. So basically what happens, if you start to get these water sprouts, or otherwise known as epicormic branching, did everyone hear that question? Uh, you know, several years after your pruning cut, you get these basically dormant buds that pop up and then you get little branches that come out. So those are called water sprouts or epicormic branching. So what you have to do, reevaluate the time of year you were pruning to make sure you were in that optimum window and you have to make sure that you're not getting too deep into that collar, okay? So if you're getting too deep into that collar, you're starting to erode a little bit of that callus tissue. So that wound wood, I mean, basically, you're getting some fracture of the dormant buds and you're stimulating growth rather than stimulating wound wood. And you'll see that, especially on black walnut, you will. So that's more of a reevaluation of technique. So it's timing and technique. Timing and technique, absolutely. Is that uh, the new branch that comes out? No, get rid of it. Get rid of it. It, it can be, yes. It can be light. It can be genetics. It can be wounding. Yeah, it can be multiple things. Yes? I have about a two-inch size walnut tree that I want to say it's maybe five inches tall. It has no central leaders. Everything is coming out. Octopus. Yeah, so sometimes those trees, basically, if you cannot correct it to <coughs> resemble a tree that you find attractive or worthy, then you have to start over. So instead of going at it 100% in one given year, start by going in cycles or stages. Prune a little bit one year, then go the next year, prune a little bit more. If you absolutely need to save that one tree, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the best uh, recommendation I can give you. Sometimes, remember, you just you cannot correct it. Sometimes you can't. That coppice tree, is that new shoot coming up from the original? Yeah, you want that to develop or come from basically the basal struts. And you want that to come from the root collar. That's the optimal area. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times you will get three to four. So let the deer pluck off a couple, and then you choose the winner after season one or after season two of coppice. You bet. What I do with deer, you know, I don't, uh, uh, you can take a twine string and treat a twine string for rust, or uh, not rust, uh, mold. Uh, but you cut a branch off the tree uh, and put the twine string around. And the bigger ones, they just put a, a treated uh, twine string around, and that keeps the deer away. But uh, um, that also helps the young trees with the rabbits too, you know, trimming branches, get the branches down on the ground, <coughs> give the rabbits some meat so they don't eat the yeah. trees. And that's a good point. And if a lot of you had to do it all over again, just like tell every forest landowner, overwhelm wildlife with trees per acre. If you have the means to go beyond 10 by 10, 436 trees per acre, do it. All right, if you can plant 8 by 8, 8 by 10, do it is then you can get away from some of these wildlife problems. But there are some disadvantages, because now you're going to have to go back in and reselect kind of some of your better trees. So there are trade offs But if you have the means, higher density plants work better. The reason why there are so many quality veneer, you know, black walnut trees in natural forest, why? Because they grew up with 10,000 seedlings around them. All right? You cannot, re you cannot replicate those standards by planting 400. You can't, but it takes a lot of work. You disagree, sir? No, I didn't say no. density there. That don't work either because we're old and stuff. If you've got a high enough deer population, the only way you can get them started is you've got to tool them or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One last question. The scrub trees, the little ones that aren't going to mount to anything? Or I'll, leave, I'll leave those for rubbing. Leave those for rubbing. And for diversity too. I mean, you're gonna get box elder and you know hawthorn and stuff like that come in. I mean, if, unless they're competing with the crown, those black walnut trees or whatever your crop trees are, I mean, it's diversity, it's wild diversity, and that's not a bad thing. All right. Thank you. Thank you.